And thank you to the fathers who are here. Happy Father's Day. Uh, yeah. Special acknowledgement. Huh? Yeah. Um, so mostly I'm going to refer you to the website for more information on uh, Doug has, you know, filled our website quite well. And we have a busy schedule. So um, I will say that at Crassus, the signups are full. And next month, we're going to have a few past um, readings from Ekphrasis to uh, remind everybody how, how it works. Um, we're open for anthology submissions, so we hope everyone will submit. That's through August. Um, there are numerous writing opportunities on the website, so take a look at them. Uh, and the one I would mention is the California Library submissions about COVID. Uh, I checked with them, and they are continuing to accept submissions through summer. So it's not too late to go ahead and do that. And we have eight poets from uh, the writers of the Mendocino Coast in the river, um, the Rhythm Running River Show on KZYX. So take a look at that. I know some people are here. Priscilla is on it. Lynn is on it. I can't remember who else. Anybody else? Oh, Elizabeth is on it. That's right. So um, there are eight of our members. So take a look and uh, take a listen. So I think we'll just jump into today. We have uh, interviews with three different authors. We'll start with uh, Jenny Warby interviewing uh, Nona Smith. Nona's probably most known for her stuffed emptying the hoarder's nest, but she's um, recently had three pieces accepted in um, a book called Musings and Ravings from a Pandemic Year that um, The Right Spot has put on. So I will let the two of you go ahead and get started. Great, thanks. I'm excited about interviewing Nona because there's some questions I've been meaning to ask her too. <laughs> so I'm just going to jump in with um, when did you discover you were a writer? Early in life or late in life? Well, I, I would think early. I would think um, um, in junior high. I signed up for a, a journalism class and um, it just kind of sparked something. It was like I know how to do this, although I was given very spe specific instruction on how to write journalistically. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, you know, the who, the what, where, when, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 well, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, then I continued in high school in, in journalism, and we put out a weekly four-page newspaper. Um, I got to be the mm, copy editor and proofreader. So that has come kind of come around here. Yes, um, certainly. <laughs> I, I couldn't, it's kind of interesting to, to see all the little markings that I remember from 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> who was, who inspired you? Did somebody, did a teacher ever say anything to you or, you know? Not that teacher. Not that teacher, okay. <laughs> um, in, Jumped ahead. You know, in, in college, I took a, a English lit class um, from this at UCLA. There were 500 people in the class. Um, and we were, our test was um, to identify uh, unknown uh, parts of poems from famous poets. So, so he would give us these little snippets of poems we'd never read before. Uh, and he'd say, identify them and justify your ID. And uh, when I got my blue book back, it said, I, I got a B and I was happy about that. <laughs> but then I read what he wrote on it. And he said, you've missed them all. You not you didn't get one right, but you wrote it so well. <laughs> Give me a B. But it, that's good. <laughs> it's always that's a great inspiration. Yeah, that was a, it was kind of clarification for me that this was okay, easy to do. That's wonderful. I love that story. Um, what do you think most characterizes your writing? Humor. Humor. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> we can attest. <laughs> and um, so what inspires you? Do you have well, since mostly what I wrote, write is personal yeah. essay, mm -hmm. just about anything. Um, um, in okay, in the musings and ravings uh, from a pandemic year, which is available at gallery now and on Amazon, um, I wrote about face masks, and I've written about 
I, anything. I mean, anything will inspire me. I was uh, in Safeway the other day. And you know how you have to be um, socially distanced. And so I found this shortest socially distanced line and um, it, it put me halfway down the uh, ice cream aisle. <laughs> so I started reading. And uh, it turns out good humor um, still makes a popsicle. Uh, what do they call it? They're called creamsicles. Creamsicles. Remember yes. creamsicles? <laughs> Good humor still makes them. It's the only product they make. Um, uh, oh, there was a product there called Fat Boy. <laughs> would you would you mean an ice cream called Fat Boy? I mean, mm. <laughs> and not only that, but there's um, Fat Boy Junior. <laughs> Just yeah. working so, up to Fat Boy by eating yeah. ice cream. And so <laughs> then I, I left Safeway and I went to Harvest to see you know what the difference is between. Safeway's ice cream aisle and Harvest's ice cream aisle. And Harvest, you know, has all this. Well, okay, so they have non dairy ice cream, big selection of non dairy ice cream. Here's my, here's my grocery list. So on the back of it, I made some notes. So the Harvest carries Rebel ice cream, which is high in fat and low in carbos. <laughs> um, and something called Peekaboo. <laughs> Peekaboo. <laughs> Christine, <laughs> mute yourself. <laughs> Peekaboo ice cream has hidden veggies in it. <laughs> so, so this this will turn into a story at some point. I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> um, what did you find useful learning to write? Well, aside from that journalism class that I took early on, I think my writing group. Um, has taught me how to be a grown-up writer, uh, what to look for, um, how important that first sentence is that, that that's supposed to grab a, a mm -hmm. reader and hold their interest, and something that I might be able to circle back around to toward at the end of a story. I think that's. I think the, the first sentence, I mean, so many editors won't go past reading the first page. So if you can't grab them in the beginning, you're right. right, and the first sentence is so, so important, so and important. I'll work on that first sentence before I even sit down on the computer. I, mm -hmm. But I go to bed at night, I'll think of it. And, I, and just, it, it takes me a long time to come up with that first sentence and right. feel satisfied. Yeah, I looked today and it was a book I was reading just to see what the first sentence is and whether the DNA of the story was in it. And it, and it was, I'm reading the Odyssey Museum or something or other. I don't can't re remember the title of books or the authors. So, <laughs> but I thought that I've read about two hundred pages, and it definitely the first sentence had a hint of what was to come. Yeah, and was and was a cap hook you. You don't want to slip and slide into a first sentence at all. Right, and I think actually j journalism was helpful with that. Yeah, because, because it's the inverted mm -hmm. pyramid. The yep. get get the story, punch them in the face right in the beginning, and then tell them the rest of the story. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well. You're, that story that you're writing, um, the Dust Bowl story, yeah. or have written, right. that, that <laughs> yes. first sentence. Yes, whatever that was. We probably have changed it by now. We're not talking. Okay. <laughs> no, you're not interviewing me. I'm interviewing you. Okay. <laughs> so I want to know what projects you're working on at the moment. Well, um, I, I finished, um, well, I, Finished. When do, when do we ever finish? Right. Um, I completed the story of, um, if I was really good here, I'd come up with my elevator speech, but okay. It's a story of a woman whose name is Emma Hartman. She's a writer and um, she's a writer of mystery stories and her neighbor disappears. Her neighbor and dear friend disappears. And this is a story told with humor, um, at least I hope so, uh, of, of Emma, who uh, in the search for her friend, who's missing, she finds herself. So um, that's what I'm working on, the umpteenth revision of that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, then I'm also doing a little um, review, I guess, of things that have happened in the past. Right now I'm writing about my career as a social worker. 
like I even knew what that was when I graduated <laughs> college. Um, I think we've, we've kind of covered what I wanted to ask. I know that you're going to do a reading and I'd like to give you a little more time to do that. Oh, a little you. reading. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to read um, an excerpt of um, a very short story. I'm only going to read it if I can put my glasses on. And we haven't had too much wine. I'm sure she'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> Maybe you want to know. <laughs> okay. So this is just part of part of the um, story. It's called The Year of the Accessory Mask. I celebrated my birthday last year in coronavirus lockdown mode. As you might expect, it was socially distanced and a quiet affair. The birthday cards I received via snail mail were mostly about drinking martinis and cats. <laughs> and the presents were viral themed, beautifully wrapped antibacterial soaps, a heavenly, heavily lavender scented, just the right size to keep in the car, hand sanitizer kit, and face masks. I bought my first face mask in early February before wearing them was mandated, but after it was apparent they were going to be difficult, if not impossible, to obtain here at the coast. An entrepreneurial local woman who made lovely lingerie repurposed her business from undies and bras to mask making. Tiny, very feminine bows with the stitching that attached the elastic ties to the side of the mask. Elastic ties that caught my hair in tangles when I put it on and again when I took it off. <laughs> that and the fact that it looked like I had an A-cup bra on my face made me cut <laughs> this item away and look for another version. The second mask came to me by way of the generosity of my neighbor, Betty, who was turning them out by the dozens and donating them to family, friends, and the local hospital. Come over and choose one for yourself and one for art, she said. Standing the appropriate rope remoteness from her, I pointed to a lovely floral print mask displayed on a bench close to her entryway. Eyeing the others and searching for a more masculine design, I selected one in brown tones for art. Once home, I took a good look at my choice for him and saw that the print was of cute cavorting rodents. <laughs> That's not the <laughs> end. No, you have, you have time. Do you have time left? That was, to, weren't there more? <laughs> I love that. I, okay. I love <laughs> that. You've got time. We, we Do might, I? Yeah, we're okay. fine. All right. You know, don't we? Yeah. Well, Betty's mask creations attach the mask to the face with over the head wide elastic bands. Although much better than the first mask in both appearance and comfort, the elastic bands were too long to keep it properly in place. It kept creeping up under my eyes and tickling my lower lashes, <laughs> making it impossible for me to read my grocery list or see the arrows on the floor pointing my way, the way my cart should be headed. <laughs> My sister, who doesn't sew, but is a big online shopping fan, came to the rescue with two birthday present masks. Both have come broke behind the ear attachments, but I need to be careful taking them off to make sure my expensive hearing aids don't slip off with them. One mask is cotton in my favorite shades of green, and the other, the one that actually fits me the best, is crocheted. <laughs> But still, it stays properly in place and doesn't tangle my hair and doesn't look like a bra. <laughs> so with so little else to occupy me, I admit I've spent several hours on the computer checking out more options. It seems that in the past two months, an entire cottage industry has sprung up around masks. They're made from various kinds of materials and every color and pattern imaginable. Paisley bandanas that stagecoach robbers used to wear and masks resembling Darth Vader masks made out of yarmulkes and others out of LED rechargeable glow in the dark lights. I found a variety of um, pack, a variety pack of masks with different smiley faces so a person could conceivably display their mood on any given day and yet remain socially distanced. My favorite to date is the bead fringed multifunctional neck gaiter, which does double duty, allowing its wearer to act as a responsible masked citizen in public. 
while it converts into an elegant accessory scarf with a little tuck maneuver when visiting with one's socially sanctioned pod. <laughs> During these weeks and months of lockdown, when it seems our whole way of life is eroded, I've managed to avoid spending a great deal of time wondering, read, worrying about the future. We're in unknown territory, and I can't begin to imagine what life post-COVID will look like. I'm hoping that we'll be able to return to socializing mask-free. I like to imagine that sometime in the not too distant future, a young child will come across a stash of masks and wonder what they were used for. I'm wishing that when this curious child is told they were supposed to keep us from spreading a dangerous virus, that child won't snicker the way we do now when we remember how sheltering under our school desks and covering our heads with our arms was supposed to protect us from atomic fallout. Oh, that was wonderful. <laughs> That's great. great. It's going to be a hard act to follow you too. It is going to be. <laughs> so okay. Um, can, I jump in? can I jump in to ask that people mute themselves? Everybody, please mute yourself because mute ourselves now. People are laughing yeah, and if you're, <laughs> wait, your face is coming up. It's mute. So, Just mute us. Anyway, thank you all. Move and swear. Mute us. <laughs> Okay, so good advice. Um, so I'm going to introduce Katie Pye, who has, um, it's an eclectic writer. She has um, written the YA novel Elizabeth's Landing, which has won numerous awards, and um, Tracking the Flash, my lighthouse travel log, and I Spy, Who's Using My Garden, a pollinator garden workbook. So quite, um, quite varied. Uh, I'm going to start, I think, Katie, with the same question. I like that one. When did you discover you were a writer? Well, um, I've been sporadic at writing all my life. So I started as a um, child writing poetry mostly. Um, and then as I got into later years, I wrote um, prose, took some classes in creative writing and really found that I enjoyed it a lot. And then, you know, it went for a while and then stopped for a long time. I went back to college and didn't have time. So I got back to it when I moved over here to Mendocino and really, and started taking classes at the college and, and um, you know, went as far as uh, getting into writing a novel, wanting to do that. And um, once I got through that and self-published Elizabeth's Landing, I felt like I could really say I am a writer. So it, it took a while to internalize that that I am a writer. So. It's a hard one for me too. Okay, so <laughs> what um, what did you find most useful in learning to write? In all learning, how to, learning how to write and taking it seriously, really. Um, once I decided that I wanted to write the novel and I started at it, uh, I, I enjoyed what I was doing, but um, it, you know, it wasn't coming easily. And I really decided that I needed to spend time reading um, books about writing, um, you know, going online and there are various things online and, you know, continuing to take uh, classes and, and share my work there. Um, uh, you know, was, I was in writers groups and, and one of the things that helped me, Ginny was in my first writing group and she kept saying, um, where's the conflict? Where's the tension? And I thought I was doing a great job, you know, but I was writing nice. And so it took me a number of months to, you know, and study and, and rewriting, rewriting, and getting feedback that uh, to get to the point where I understood what she was talking about. And then it was really fun because you get into the mind of the reader and, um, you know, they're asking what happens next, what happens next. And that's really keys into the creative process of, of for yourself, you know, giving, giving me a guide of where I want to go. So. So those things are, you know, the group and um, the groups and also taking it seriously. So what do you think is the most difficult part of your writing process? I don't think I'm different from a lot of writers in that believing that people want to actually read what I write, um, that gets in the way uh, a lot. Uh, and also beginning a piece, uh, nothing unusual for a lot of writers either. Um, but 
on the other side of it, I really love revising. I don't that I've gotten to the point where that's not hard and I look forward to it because <laughs> I know that the hard part's over. So. So what advice would you give to new writers? Um, exactly what, what uh, you've been hearing and will hear about you know, getting your, do it, get it on the page. It doesn't matter what's on the page um, and take yourself seriously that, that this is something that you can do and it takes practice and it's a craft and get it out there to other people so you can hear what other people are hearing and uh, appreciating uh, that you might not because they, you, you know, you have your characters or whatever it is in your own head, but um, other people are going to hear things and feel things differently. So it can be very, very valuable. If you're writing a novel, one of my favorite books, and uh, I think that is just brilliant, is um, Story by uh, Robert McKee. I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, he, if you're doing storytelling, he is, that book is brilliant. It's about writing um, for movies and scripts and things like that, but it applies perfectly to, to writing short stories or anytime you're going to have characters. So, so before you got it. <laughs> got it. Yes. Um, so before you do your reading, um, what are you working on now? I'm not doing anything other than a blog, occasional blog for um, that supports uh, the I Spy pollinator book, mm -hmm. uh, you know, telling people about pollinators and what's happening in my own garden. So other than that, um, that keeps me busy enough when I when I do it. So you have something for us to hear? I do. Good. This is the beginning of Elizabeth's Landing. Elizabeth, I'll preface it, Elizabeth is a young girl who's moved with her parents to uh, Texas from Missouri. Uh, she is not adjusting well and has difficulties within the family and at school. So here she goes. Straighten that girl out before it's too late. Here, grandpa's trapped dad inside the sway back garage behind our dump of a rental house. Another one of his I know best lectures spews out the open window. Only this morning's gripe isn't about dragging for shrimp, dad's landscaping job, or mom being gone. It's about me. I straddle my bike, bend low and roll in close, listening for one more reason to hate this place. Grandpa's smoker's hack rips through the air. My God, he coughs and huffs a second for breath. At 14, I was working, not lazing around Highland Beach or pouting like I was owed better. My daddy made clear I had to amount to something. My cheeks sting. I press my chin hard onto the bars so I don't blow up. The old crank deserves it, though. Four months and six days since Mom, Dad, and I moved here to help out him and Grandma Linny. Waste of time. Nothing stops his carping about everything and everybody. A match snaps. Smoke from Grandpa's cigarette snarls over the sill. I pinch my nose against the stink and wait for Dad to stick up for me, for us. Go ahead, tell that walking chimney this relocation plan is over. Mom gets back, one U-Haul and three days we're home in Coulter City. Back to the way things were before he ruined our lives. Give it a rest, Pop. Dad's voice is frayed. If you want to fish tomorrow, I've got an engine to fix. The toolbox lid clanged shut. Screwdrivers and wrenches clunk together as he drags the box off the workbench. I wait for him to say more, but all I hear are his footsteps as he heads toward the door. I slam my fist against the garage wall. Thanks for nothing, Dad. Gravel spins under my back tire as I jam the pedal hard. I careen past Dad, standing in the open doorway, hand raised, maybe to protect himself from flying rocks, maybe to slow me down. I flash a, see ya, wave over my shoulder. Elizabeth, he hollers, you've got chores. The front wheel wobbles. I swerve, barely missing the front bumper of his truck on my way to the street. I'm not listening and I won't be at Highland if you come looking. Six blocks down, I glance past the beach and Ghost Crab Bay to the far shoreline at the Gulf. I ride hard away from the downtown glitzy offices, restaurants, and tourist shops toward Wayward Landing Beach, five miles out. 
Dad would kill me if he knew where I'm going. With mom gone and grandpa breathing down his neck, he's turned into super worrier dad. But by the time he's home from working on the Linny Jean, I'll be safely back in my boring room, counting oak leaves out the, on the tree outside my window. For now, I'm free from chores and from not measuring up. I kick out my feet and sail onto the county road, head back, sucking in warm air. The salty tang of drying seagrass fills my nose. Through gaps in the high dunes along the road's edge, I glimpse flashes of gray-green gulf under bright blue sky. Three miles from the landing, I flatten over the bars to pick up speed past the development I call Mansion Land. A thick sea mist floats toward the scattered line of fake brick driveways, stone pillars, and locked gates with scrolled names like Lost Resort, Pirate's Wake, and Eagle's Rest. Like overloaded freighters, do dozens of white and pastel colored mega homes ride the sand. For sale signs, litter the beach alleyways between houses. I hit my brakes in front of a six by eight foot billboard. That wasn't here three weeks ago. The black trimmed gold letters holler like all caps in an email. Opportunity of a lifetime. One and a half miles of beachfront bliss. Multiple or single lots. Contact Pioneer Development, Inc. A dragonfly, the deep red orange sunset, the deep red orange of sunset, buzzes onto a morning glory stem winding between the sign's wooden legs. Before I can reach my camera, the bug catches an offshore gust and is gone. Bliss for what? Next year, bulldozers could be scraping out driveways for mansion land too. Like almost happened to the forest around Pickett's Pond back home six years ago. Almost, but didn't thanks to dad. Lately, it feels like that dad, the one with the guts, got left behind in Coulter City. I push on through the layer of sand that's retaking the roadside. Port Winston's not my place. Out here, right now, it's not my problem. Thank you. My book club read your book and it was my first YA novel and I loved it. Thank so, you. Yeah, Thank you. Lovely. Okay, we might have time for questions afterwards. We'll see. So um, next is Catherine Brown interviewing Norma Watkins, um, beloved creative writing instructor here, but most famous for her memoirs, The Last Resort, Taking the Mississippi Cure and That Woman from Mississippi. So um, I'll let the two of you take it away. Okay, I'm going to throw you a little, little different one, Norma. Uh, I, I liked what they were using as their first question, so I'm going to go with that. When did you discover you were a writer? If that's different from uh, when did I actually begin writing, I think I discovered I could write in sixth grade when they used to give you those little assignments, you know, what did you do last summer? Write a paragraph about this book. And I would do it and the teacher would give me an A and I would do another one, she'd give me an A. And sometimes I got to read them out loud and I love to read out loud. And um, so, yeah, I think I thought then that I was good at that, but I certainly didn't start writing then. Okay. So what would you say what have you put most of your effort into regarding writing? I think I put most of my effort into revising. Uh, I have a friend who's a rather famous Southern author, and she once told me not to be in any hurry. <laughs> There's plenty of time. Just get it right. And I'm afraid I took her literally because the book I'm working on now in our writing group, I began in the early 2000s when I was in graduate school. And the book I have coming out next year, I started looking today and the earliest files I see on that are 2016, but I think I started long before then. So I, I think there's a part of me that thinks I'm gonna live forever. <laughs> and we hope you do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and what would you do if you could do something differently? I wish that I had taken myself more seriously as a writer sooner. I spent years uh, working on sustainability at the college where I taught, writing newspaper articles um, 
to promote our programs, how to eat without harming the planet, how to grow organic vegetables in South Florida, how to orient your home in a hot, humid climate. And I didn't start writing for myself until I turned my PhD dissertation into a novel that went nowhere. And that novel became the pair of memoirs that I have published, The Last Resort and That Woman. Um, so I feel like I wish I'd started sooner. Uh, So which part of the process is most difficult for you as a writer? I think, I think plot is the hardest for me. I'm I feel like I'm good with characters. I'm good with dialogue. I can see the people I'm writing about. I can hear them talking, um, but I'm not great at suspense. Um, my books don't have a lot of physical mayhem. Uh, I write what was once disparagingly called um, women's writing about the triumphs and despairs of ordinary people. Okay. Um, have you written things that you haven't published? Oh yeah, oh, <laughs> have, I, have I ever. Um, I, um, <laughs> I don't think I've ever told y'all that I have a complete book of erotic short stories. No. And, then, and then when I got it back from the publisher, he said, I'm returning this before it burns a hole in our shelf. Um, you have to bring I'll, that to, to our writing group. We want to read those. Huh? I don't even I don't even dare look at it anymore. <laughs> I kind of I kind of picture my children finding it after I'm dead. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, in horror. Um, I have a novel called Eat that I, about a food writer that I'm working on in our writing group now. I have a finished novel about what would happen if all our environmental dreams came true. Believe it or not, that one's called Great Mother of Big Apples. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a novel about two orphans who try to make it on their own in New York City. I have half novels about a woman who grows roses and another one about a woman who marries three men named Otto. <coughs> Lots of them. Yeah, and the, the story you wrote about the woman uh, works for a newspaper, something about the worms on the roof. I remember that, that always stuck with me. Didn't they put all their compost into a worm pile or something? I think that might have been, yes, another one I started and got stuck on. <laughs> you say you're most proud of in your writing life thus far? You know, I'm proud of getting two books out. My children might not agree. Um, and and um, I'm proud of sticking with it. Um, I think that is the hardest thing to do, especially if you're a writer who starts late. So that used to be my advice to students, persevere, stick with it. If you have a story to tell, and who, who of us does not, um, don't let anybody talk you out of doing it, especially your family, and especially that voice in your head that tells you you're no good. Um, and I tell people a page a day, a book a year. So, you know, just stick with it. That's what I keep telling myself. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I want to give you time to read, and we're all anxious for that, so I'm going to mute myself and let you read a little something. I've been thinking about the, um, the thing about the first sentence. You better, get, you better get your meaning in the first sentence. So I'm going to read you um, the opening of In Common, which is the book I have coming out next year. I'm only going to read 400 words, and... Um, Afterwards, I'll get you to tell me what the theme is. Before dawn on a March morning in 1933, Velma Vernon, nine years old and already tall for her age, set onions behind Uncle Drew's tractor. South Mississippi stirred from winter. 
a mist hung over the low end of the field and the, the plow cut loamy furrows into the cold soil. Uncle Drew sang, life is just a bowl of cherries, his voice loud over the engine's growl. Velma sang along, straddling the row, stooping every six inches to place a baby onion, standing to pull another from her sack. The singing stopped. Trying to turn at the bottom of the field, Uncle Drew had backed the tractor into a ditch. Cussing, he revved the machine back and forth. He called to Velma, go get your papa and tell him to bring me a couple of boards. Velma skipped over the furrows, singing the second line of Uncle Drew's song. Don't take it serious, it's too mysterious. The words felt ticklish on her tongue and she was glad for a break. It took 150 onion sets to plant one 80 foot row. They had done 10 rows so far and her hands felt stiff. The sun rose behind the mist, turning it gold. Velma stopped to admire it. Inside the dark barn, she found Papa sharpening an ax on the foot pedal grinder. God darn it, he said, every year, I remind the man to cut the furrows shorter when he gets to the bottom of that field. He scrambled through the used lumber pile and pulled out a couple of two by sixes. They headed back. When they came over the rise, Papa started running. Velma ran after him. The tractor lay on its side at the bottom of the ditch. Papa shut off the engine. In the sudden quiet, his voice sounded strange. Sister? Don't come any closer. Velma couldn't stop herself. The rusty red machine rested squarely on Uncle Drew's chest. His eyes were open. Pink foam bubbled from his mouth. If only she had run instead of skipping. If she hadn't kept singing or stopped to look at the mist. Guilt and grief weighed on her like a sack she couldn't put down. For the first year, she dreamed the accident almost every night. She woke screaming and mama would come. Shush, Velma, it's nobody's fault. Drew made a bad choice and every now and then one of them will kill you. Thank you. So do people want to guess the theme? That's unanimous. <laughs> do you want to tell us? Well, I think I think the theme oh, wait, Arlene wants to guess. Oh good. It, it has to have it has to do with bad choices. It oh, just, I agree. Yeah, it just has to be. <laughs> yeah. 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 Every now and then one of those choices will kill you. Okay, we do have time for questions. Do people have questions for any of the authors? I have a question. Um, I've heard that um, almost everybody's got writing groups or um, so I just wanted to hear a little bit more about how working in groups um, you know, helps everybody keep going and um, and I, I really love the the supportive environment of the Mendocino Coast writers. And um, so how do you find your groups or what, what are some of the benefits of, of working with the other writers when you're, when you're trying to produce a product? Well, Nona and I are in the same group, so we could both answer. Um, mm -hmm. uh, our group, Pickles, uh, Jenny would know, Jenny's better at dates, but we've been going on since it was only Ginny and Suzanne, and then Ginny and Suzanne and me. Mm -hmm. So it's practically since I came to live on- I need two or three. It's pr practically since I came to live on the coast. Yeah. And, and membership has changed through the years. People come and go, and that's fine. Maureen stayed with us till she finished her memoir, then done. Um, um, I, what would you say, Nona, about the way the group works? Well, um, I, okay, well, how this group works is that um, we send our chapters um, or short stories to each other um, during the week. 
and we meet twice a month. And during the week, um, we have time to edit our, each other's work. And then uh, when we meet together, we go over the editing remarks, but it's a big picture thing. Sometimes it's a small picture thing, like move your sentence up here, or that, that's not the right word. Mm -hmm. But basically, it's a big picture thing. I'm in another writing group where um, we don't do any homework. We're the lazy lot. And <laughs> we, I, I've been in that writing group for eight years. And we meet once a week. And we deal with commas. <laughs> and, and what isn't the right word and maybe uh, what doesn't belong in a chapter. So it, it's different things, but I find two things. I find that if two people say, I'm sorry, this is, you were, no, no. She, well, I find that if two people criticize something, um, and I, will, I will change it, period. I don't even try to justify it. I, if two people don't get it or think it's not the right thing, then I will change it because basically I want people, I'm writing so that people can understand. Um, and the other thing is that I find myself channeling what people are going to say. Um, certain people are concerned about verbs. Some certain people are concerned about um, um, how things, you, you can't say that because two chapters ago you said that. So, so I find myself <laughs> channeling that those people before I even get there. So that's how it's helped me. Norma and I have been together in the same writing group, I think since the early 90s. I mean, it, I moved here in 91 and I think we met in like 93 or something. So, um, and I, I channel her. I go through, <laughs> I think, oh my, I might as well just go ahead and take this out because yeah. it'll never see the light of day if I let Norma at it, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Catherine? Yes, and um, uh, and I can I ask another one. Sure. <laughs> um, so I'm also. Uh, what are some of the tricks to keep you going? Um, I don't know if anybody feels stuck, but do you, any of you have some tricks that keep you going when um, sometimes you just don't feel like writing, or you you just want to, you know, that doesn't seem to come to you at the moment. Bottle of wine. <laughs> art. Bottle what did Art say? A bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I one think of the things that keeps you going, obviously, is that you have to you have to show if you're in a writer's group, you have to produce eventually. I mean, you have to do something. Although I admit that I didn't for three years um, at one point. <laughs> Um, but I think that uh, it, it, as long as you have to produce, that's, you know, make, make that sort of lights a fire under you. I think for, for um, me, I had a, a really stuck period of, of at least a year. One of the, one of the things that I found um, because I was writing a novel was a, a site where a fellow had you submit, the, the focus was on the first page and he had you, so you submit your first page and then he would go through and and talk about what was working and what could be you know better, um, but also people could you know put in their own uh, take on it. So that just going through whatever it is that you go through where you see that process and and you know getting exposed to other people's writing and whether it's groups or some however you do it. Um, I at least could then look back at my own writing and I, it finally broke me so that I could see, well, that's why that isn't working or it, I see that in somebody else. And so I now can internalize that and fix what isn't, you know, that's similar that isn't um, working for me. So, and other than just sitting down and not, and getting past that voice that says, oh, you have to have something to say before you write anything. And if you're really stuck, just blah 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 even if it's that you know to get the the computer keys or the pencil or whatever it is going um because I, you know i told you i really like revising and so if if the goal is i can't wait to get revising then you know it's easier to, to just put whatever junk on the page and then stick and then go back and say oh that really is terrible but at least it's got an idea or something or maybe it doesn't but but just just do it. 
regardless. I found my writing group, which is the group, one of the groups that Nona's in, has really been invaluable for keeping me going. I've seemed to have had long periods when my uh, my my motivation sort of flagged, life was getting in the way, I wasn't making the writing a priority. But as Ginny said, if you're in a group, you have, you, you know, you want to bring something as often as possible, if not every single time. So that alone was helpful. But sometimes people would just make very helpful suggestions. Like I remember one time, one of the people in the group said, when I said, I just don't know where these characters are going. I don't, I don't see where I'm going here. I have no idea what's supposed to happen next. And this person said, well, think ahead to something you'd like to write about that you think is likely to happen for them, even if you're not sure where they are right now, how to get from here to there. Just jump ahead somewhere where you've got some energy and just write, just write there and don't worry about how you're gonna link up the two. Eventually you'll figure it out. That was a really good suggestion. So I just dropped where I was because I didn't see any path forward. And I went ahead to a scene that I thought was probably likely to happen and that was exciting to write about and it kind of brought back my my energy. And just the fact that if people really believe in you and you've been in this group for a while and you've sort of, everybody understands sort of your voice and kind of your, your way of writing, people can really be extremely helpful to you. So I have found, I'm like Nona, if a couple people haven't gotten something that's happening or they'll say to me, but you know, she wouldn't say that. If so-and-so, she, she doesn't talk like that, you know? <laughs> so I don't hear her sit, I don't hear those words in her mouth, you know? Then I have to think about, oh, okay, this doesn't sound true to the character. So it's, it's just helpful when, when you hear it from more than one person and, um, like uh, like Norma, I wish I had started 20 years ago. <laughs> I've been straggling along with this novel for God, over 10 years, but I'm really close to getting it out to somebody for for some professional editing, which feels like a huge a huge thing. And and actually got to the end. Uh, I'm just trying to do the revising part that Katie said. So I would say to help your motivation, to help your morale, to keep you focused and also to give you really concrete, specific, helpful tips uh, that a writing group is invaluable. And I'm saying that as somebody who was in writing classes, including with Norma for quite a few years at the college, which got me started when I moved here 16 years ago. That was extremely helpful. And at a certain point in time, I gravitated into a group and I was looking for something more, more in depth than what I was getting in the in the class, and that would be a smaller group and more a little bit more intense. So all of those things have been helpful. And Catherine, if you're looking for a group to be in, I think just putting the word out that you're looking for a group to be in, and a group will turn up. Oh, I actually lead my own group. Uh, I, I have for a few years, so. Um, a small group that, but we don't meet as often as you all, just once a month, but still it's very helpful. I find different groups work differently. So it's interesting to hear how everybody else works. Yeah. And, and there's a new writing teacher at the college. So it might be interesting just to go back uh, when he teaches the class, um, not the credit class, but the other one, uh, just to see what he's like, because very often a new teacher you know, has things to say we haven't heard. Is that Philip? What's his name, Catherine? I can't think of his name. Vincent. Vincent, Vincent. Puerto Rico. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And he's from the, he's um, teaching the, the um, non-credit class until spring. Is he from um, Ukiah? Yes. He was from yeah. Ukiah. He's moved here now. Oh, I've met him. Yeah. Yeah, he's young. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Oh, excuse yeah. Excuse -moi. <laughs> <laughs> I just energetic. Want to, I wanted to say something about classes because I you know I moved here in 2010 and started taking classes a few months later with Norma and 
never even thought, I mean, actually I was going to sign up for an art class and there wasn't room. So that's how much I thought about writing, you know? <laughs> and to have somebody who's enthusiastic about what you write means everything. Yeah. And all of a sudden the possibility becomes a dream for you. I don't know uh, where it will go. I feel dry as a bone at the moment. <laughs> um, but I really feel like that, you know, something was opened up for me to explore. And no matter where it goes, it brings up so many things within yourself, so many thoughts, um, so much of a way of looking at your life all of a sudden that you never had before. So it's, I think I'm happy to hear there's somebody new coming to do the classes there. I, I'm, I think that would be wonderful. Susan writes magical stories that are disguised version of her own marriage um, that remind me, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Laurie Moore's writing. You know, Laurie Moore writes, and maybe I'm not thinking of this right Laurie, but the one I'm thinking of honestly writes the best happy books I've ever read. She also wrote cookbooks and she died very young of a heart attack. But if you ever want to just cheer yourself up enormously, I'll find her real name is probably not Laurie Moore. It's probably Laurie somebody else. But that's the kind of story Susan tells. And you just read them and you want to be in that marriage. You think this would just be so lovely. <laughs> that's cool. So there's a question in the chat. Uh, Nona, put the word out where? Well, uh, one writer place club. is in our, <laughs> in our writer writing, club. writer's group, um, I, I'm sure. And um, and actually, Gallery Bookstore at one point was um, collecting names to put together that, you know, people were, could connect with each other. And maybe Christy is doing, will do that again if we ask her. But certainly our book, um, our group meetings Send it to the Writers Club website. I'll put it up there. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So we have time for another question or so. Anybody else, or are we done? No comment. No comment. <laughs> Chrissy, yeah. Catherine, what was the name that you gave the name about a fellow moving here or from oh. Ohio? Oh, Vincent. What, what's his What's his last name, Catherine? I'll put it in the chat. Could you write it out? She will. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Looks like we're done. So we'll meet you here again next month, same time. Same, well, maybe we'll see. I, I would just like to put a word in. Um, for the anthology whose theme is borders and I see many faces up there that I expect to see submissions from submission process is open right now until midnight August 31st. Um, may I ask her what did you decide about meeting in person? Um, we're still we're, we're still discussing partly because of the venue. So We'll be notifying you soon, hopefully. Oh, yeah. I didn't hear back from Jamie this last uh, question that I sent uh, Susan, so I will I will try again. Um, yeah. He is letting the writers conference meet in the garden room in September, so um, we'll see for their for their retreat. So I'm about to sneeze. So we're hoping in the next few months that we will have an in person. Maybe not in the same way we had with food because they're not doing that right now. We'll see, but maybe drinks. <laughs> BYOB maybe, <laughs> BYOB and BYOF. <laughs> Doug, did you have something you wanted to say? No, I don't. Okay, sorry, I thought I saw a hand. Well, was, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> thank you everyone. Yes, thank you. Fun. Thanks thank you. guys, fun seeing your faces. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Informed us to what happens next. Well done. Bye. Thanks, y'all. It was great.